Welcome back to my beginner's astrophotography course here on YouTube. In the first video, we looked at what camera gear you'll actually need to get started. And if you watched that video, you know you don't really need all that much to get great results. Today, we're going to talk about planning. Because before you head out on your first night, there are some general things you want to do. That way, it's not a complete failure. And the first thing I'd like us to look at is an application called Stellarium. This is a free download for Mac, Windows, and Linux. And you can also get the application on your smartphone although that costs a couple bucks. Once you've gotten Stellarium installed on your computer, you can follow along with us, I'd recommend it. And if you open up the application over on the left, if you hover there, you can see all your different tabs. We're gonna start off on the location window right here. This is where you wanna verify that everything is set correctly. You can either just click a point and it will move the arrow. As long as you're fairly close, that's gonna work fine. You can also try and search for your location over here or enter your latitude and longitude. But as long as you're in the general region, it's going to do okay. The big thing is that the time zone is set correctly. If the time zone is not set correctly, then it might show the sun's coming up at 2 in the morning, and that's really going to confuse you. So verify that all looks good. Once you've gotten that figured out, we can close out of the location window, go back to the left, and open up the date and time window. And this is one of the reasons that Stellarium is so great, because you can plan out your astrophotography photo shoot for tomorrow, or next year if you're planning a trip out to some cool location. Tonight we've got the moon out pretty much all night long. And that's one of my favorite reasons to use Stellarium because a lot of people, they forget to think about the moon and they think, oh, I finally have a clear night tonight. Let me go out and shoot. They get out there and they realize the moon's up all night. And that's really gonna hamper your ability to take those amazing photos of the objects that you want. And the way I think about it is the moon is almost like a big city floating in the sky. It's letting off a lot of light pollution just like LA or any other city would. And that light pollution is gonna cover up some of the fainter details, add gradients and color cast to your images, and you just don't want it in your photo, especially if you just have a normal DSLR. And for that reason, here in Stellarium, I'll just go through day by day and see when is the moon no longer gonna be a concern. In this case, by early December, if we go even later December, what you'll notice is that the moon comes up about an hour later, roughly, every single day. So right now, on uh, December 8th, it'll come up at about 1 in the morning. December 9th, it'll be about 2 in the morning, 10th. You get the idea. And one of the great things about Solarium, again, is that you can really start to learn the motion of the stars and the moon and the planets, and that will help you plan things out even better. So what Stellarium is telling me right now is that if I want to get some great deep space images, I'll probably have to wait a couple days until the moon isn't out all night long. And if I want to photograph, for example, the Orion Nebula, that's one of the perfect objects to start on. If you're not sure how to find the Orion Nebula, it's pretty easy. We have these three stars in a line, which is Orion's belt. Very iconic stars, you'll be able to find them no matter what. And then if we go down below those, we have three dim stars in a line, kind of straight up and down. The middle of those three stars is the Orion Nebula. And there's a lot of interesting things going on up in this region of the sky. You've also got the Horsehead Nebula, which is at the bottom of the three bright stars. You've got some fainter stuff over here. You've got Barnard's Loop. You've got the Rosette Nebula. So this is a great region of the sky to photograph in the winter. But let's say you forget or you're looking for another object. Then you can use the search window over on the left. It's about halfway down. Once you load the search window, you can type in whatever you want. In this case, maybe we'll do Rosette Nebula. And it's automatically going to point you in the right direction. And you might be thinking, okay, well, what objects can I actually photograph with my current setup? And this really depends on your maximum focal length, which we covered in the previous video. If you've got 300 millimeters or more, then these are all gonna be great objects. The Orion Nebula, the Horsehead. Rosette's gonna be kind of more challenging though, because it's fairly dim. And if you're in a light fluid area, it's not gonna stand out as well as Orion will. So that's why I recommend everybody usually start off on the Orion Nebula. Getting back to my earlier point though, because I don't have a go-to mount, I have to find all these objects manually out there when I'm on location, which means I point my camera and lens up to these spots in the sky myself. And that can be pretty challenging, especially if you don't know where to look for. But with the help of Stellarium, you can really help to learn the night sky. Personally, the way I find the Rosette Nebula is using just a few bright pointer stars. We've got Procyon, Sirius, Rigel, and Betelgeuse kind of forming a weird shaped box. If we take Betelgeuse and Procyon, draw a straight line between the two. A little past halfway and a little bit down below that imaginary line, that's where the Rosette Nebula is at. 
And that's what I do when I'm out there on location. I look for these bright stars, I draw this imaginary line out, and then I move my camera lens roughly right around here, and then I take my test photo. If I don't see it in the frame, I make a small adjustment, take another test photo, and eventually I'll see it there in the frame. The same thing is true for the Horsehead Nebula, which is a lot easier because it's located right on a big bright star. So you can even turn on live view on your camera, move your telescope or lens around until you see this bright star in the frame, tighten everything down, take your test photo, and you should see Horsehead right there. If you want to learn more about how to find these objects yourself, I'd recommend checking out my Deep Space course where we go through and find, photograph, and edit 12 really great objects for beginners. They're usually big, bright, and relatively easy to find. And you don't need some big fancy telescope or mount to photograph them. You can do it with a reasonably uh, cheap setup. However, for those of you who want to do uh, a little bit more advanced work where you're photographing much more harder to find objects, or if you're shooting through a lot of light pollution and you're using narrowband filters, in that case, you will want to get a go-to mount. We briefly touched on those in the previous video just because I don't have any experience with them. Everything I've done has just been with a simple star tracker. But if you really want to take things to the next level, that go-to mount is going to make your night a lot easier, provided you can get it working properly. Because again, what you would do is you type in, I want to photograph Thor's helmet, and it would automatically move you to right where it needs to be. And if you have everything ready to go, you can start taking your images. Whereas without that go-to mount, you're going to be hunting here for quite a while until you find it. And I've never actually photographed Thor's helmet, so I don't know where it's at. Somewhere over here. <laughs> and that reminds me, we can just use our search window. And hopefully it will show up. Yep. Thor's helmet. All right, it's a little high, but there we go. And this is a very small object, so you would want a lot of zoom for that one. And that's why I recommend you just spend a lot of time in Stellarium if you're first getting started. Get a general feeling for the sky. Let's go to the summer months now, and we'll explain that. Because it's all about learning the motion of the moon and the planets and the stars and how things move throughout the year, that's really what's gonna help you become a better astrophotographer. So now we're in the summer months, and we're looking for the Andromeda galaxy. And if we look north, we have the Big Dipper over here. That jumps us off to Polaris, which is the North Star. This is where we're gonna be aligning to every night. And then if we follow it over, there's a the Little Dipper. So we kinda of have our bearings right now. In order to find the Andromeda galaxy, we you normally look to the northeast in the summer months. Once you look in the northeast, you have to make sure you're up late enough in the night. Right now it's one in the morning. If you're out here just after dark, things are going to be kind of rotated and Andromeda might not barely even be over the horizon yet. So this is one you want to wait a little bit later in the night. And the way I find it is I look for three bright stars arcing off the side of the Milky Way. In this case, we have one, two, and three. Once I've made sure these are the three stars I'm actually looking at, I take the middle star. And usually if you're out in a fairly dark sky, you'll see a bright star above it. It's a lot smaller though. Once I see that bright star above it, I go that same distance again, and that'll always take me to Andromeda, which we have right here. And this is a perfect object if you're shooting in the summertime to get started on. It's kind of like Orion. It's big, it's bright, it's easy to find. And that's how I find all my objects at night, is I just use pointer stars. And in this case, we have one, two, and three stars. Take the middle one, go up a little bit, Go that same distance one more time, there's Andromeda. On the other hand, if you want to photograph a smaller galaxy called Triangulum, you go back off this center star here and go down roughly the same distance as Andromeda is, and that brings you to Triangulum, which we see here. And I never bothered to learn the constellations or anything like that. I frankly only know a handful. But just by going outside and looking for bright stars, that's all I need. This is my map, and with the help of this map, I can get wherever I need to. Of course, it's going to help if you're in a darker sky, because the more light pollution you have, the less stars you're going to be able to see, and it's just going to mean a lot more guesswork for you. Now that we've covered the basics of how I find my objects manually without the help of a go-to feature, let's talk about light pollution next, because this is really going to be one of the biggest hurdles we all have to face. If you want to follow along right now, we're on lightpollutionmap.info. Once you're on lightpollutionmap.info, on the right, make sure you have World Atlas 2015 selected for the overlay. That just tends to give you the most realistic looking light pollution filter. And now you can just figure out wherever you live at and see what your current light pollution scenario is like. I'm lucky enough to be living out in Utah right now, which means I have 
very little light pollution for the most part. And this is going to tie in with Stellarium, as I'll show you in a minute. But generally, you want to think about what you're trying to photograph, and that's going to inform you which direction you want to go away from town. For example, I live in Kanab right now, and if I were to go east of town for maybe 20-30 minute drive, I can be out here in some of the darkest skies around. I'll still be able to see some light pollution from Page though, and maybe even a little bit from Kanab, but for the most part, it's going to be very dark. And let's think about this, if the Andromeda galaxy in the summer is going to be in the northeastern sky, coming out here would be the perfect spot, because there's nothing to interfere with my photos up in this area. However, if I were to come out over here, there's a few nice spots out going to the Grand Canyon. This would not be an ideal location to photograph Andromeda, because now it's going to be right through all this light pollution. There's not that much of it, but still, whenever possible, you want to factor in where your object's going to be at. Another way to think about this is if I'm going to photograph the Milky Way galaxy that's going to be in the southern sky, and that means I wouldn't want to go north of Kanab because I'm going to be shooting through all the light pollution from Kanab to shoot south. So I'd be better off, again, coming down here, and now there's nothing to the south that's going to work great. Obviously, most of us are not this lucky, though, and we have to deal with a lot more light pollution than that. For example, I used to live in Ohio, and in that case, I mean, you can't even find a dark sky in the whole state, really. Maybe a little bit down here. But even just driving 20 or 30 minutes can have a big difference. When I was first getting in astrophotography, I lived around Youngstown. And from Youngstown, you can only see the North Star, the Big Dipper, and a few other bright stars. You can't see anything else. If I got in my car, though, and drove about 30 minutes to the south, down over here, this yellow area on the light pollution map was dark enough to allow me to see the Milky Way with my naked eye. It was pretty dim, but I could definitely see it. And that was really amazing at the time because I didn't realize you can just drive 20 or 30 minutes outside of a town and be in a dark enough sky to see the Milky Way and get much better results if you're doing deep space astrophotography. And this is what I always recommend people do whenever possible is grab all your gear, drive to a nearby dark sky park. There's a lot of those across the country. If you do some research, you might be able to find one within an hour drive of your house. Although, to be honest, some of those dark sky parks are located in cities. I don't even know why, why they call them that, but... You get the idea. Again, if I was driving down here, I wouldn't want to photograph anything to the north because I'm going to have a lot of light pollution, but some of the southern objects would be perfect for this location. And if you're unable to do any traveling or if you just want to be strictly a backyard astrophotographer and you're going to be somewhere in a really light polluted area, then at that point, my recommendation would be to check out my dedicated astro camera course here on YouTube. I go into how to buy a, a monochrome camera and some specialized filters and all this stuff and how to set it up. And that course is going to show you how to get really amazing deep space images, even in light polluted areas with the help of those narrowband filters. You probably also want to get a go-to mount if you're going to be going that route because that will make things easier for you as well. But that is one option, is getting a, a higher end setup. It's going to be a steeper learning curve. It's probably going to be a little bit more expensive in the short term, but it's going to allow you to do astrophotography from your backyard all year long so you don't have to travel and get away from that light pollution. On the other hand, if you already have your DSLR and telephoto lens and you don't want to buy all that stuff, then in your case you'll want to get some type of light pollution filter. And we talked about that in the previous video in this course. As I mentioned in that video, I don't have much experience with light pollution filters, so for that reason I would pass you off to one of the other astrophotographers out there who has a lot more experience. They'll be able to tell you what filters work well and which ones don't, and maybe give you some more insight than I can. Either way, light pollution is going to be your biggest hurdle, and I get this all the time. People will email me, and they say they can't really see anything at all. And then we open up light pollution map and figure out where they're shooting from, and usually they're shooting from a red area or an orange. And I tell them, unless you have that light pollution filter and you're fairly good with editing, or you have the fancy camera with the other filters, you're really not going to be able to get those photos you want. So you have two options. You can either, like I prefer, drive out to a darker sky, which might only even be 20 minutes away, or invest the money into those specialized filters. Either way, after you go through and spend a few nights practicing, you'll be able to determine what route you want to go down. Another application you want to grab is the Photographer's Ephemeris. And this is a free web app if you want to go that route, but I'd recommend you download it on your iPhone or Android because this is one of my most used applications, whether I'm doing astrophotography or landscapes or anything else. If I load up the app here on my phone, 
There's a lot of great features here. At a glance, I can see what time the sun comes up and what time it sets. Same thing with the moon. I can see the moon comes up at 428 and it doesn't set until 539 in the morning. It even tells me the phase of the moon, which is almost full at this point. Another great feature that I like for landscapes, not really important here, but you can turn on the elevation maps and get a really detailed view of the surrounding area. And these lines on the screen, there's an orange and a yellow and a gray line. Those represent the path of the sunlight or the moonlight as it's coming up. Again, this has a lot of great features for landscape, but for astrophotography, we can turn on the little light pollution filter here and just scan things out ahead of time in case we're out there and we're not quite sure where we wanna go. By far my favorite feature though is the twilight times. If we scroll over here, this is very important information because when you're going out there to shoot, over there on the right, we see that civil twilight ends at 542, nautical twilight at 614. What that tells me, in other words, is that at 614, some of the brighter stars will become very visible like Polaris and the Big Dipper. That means I can go out there with my mount and my camera and my lens. I can set everything up. I can do my polar alignment. I can balance things. And hopefully by 6.45 p.m. in this case, that's the end of astronomical twilight. That's when it actually gets dark. And one of the things you realize as you get more into this is we need as much dark time as possible to capture our photos. So in this case, I want to be up and running at exactly 6.45. That way I'm not wasting precious darkness messing around with my camera. On the other hand, if you're going to be shooting early in the morning, then this tells me that at 5.50 a.m., we're going to start getting some light from the sky. That means I need to be done at 5.50. If I go any longer than that, the light's going to start to interfere with my images, and it's going to screw things up. So this is very valuable information because you can plan things out ahead of time, whether you're shooting in the early morning or in the afternoon or night like most of us are going to do. And it's just one thing that'll really go a long way to making your night easier. Another feature that will come in handy is on the top, it'll say, in this case, 37 degrees north, 112 degrees west. You'll need to know that information when you're using your mount. And the fact that it tells us right here is just one more reason why I love using this app, because it gives me everything I need to know at a glance. So I recommend you download the Photographer's Ephemeris on your phone. The final thing I want to cover in this video is a free website called Telescopius. This is one of the best ways to plan out your photo shoots ahead of time because you'll be able to see how the image is going to look in your camera and lens. What I'd like you to do is go up to the toolbar here and search for whatever you plan on photographing. In this case, we'll start off on Orion because that's one of the best objects in the winter months. Now we can scroll down and we see a window right here. By default, it'll probably be 400 millimeters on a full frame camera sensor. What I'd like you to do is click on the little telescope icon here and then input whatever focal length you're using. Maybe you have a big 600 millimeter lens or just a 70 to 200, whatever you have. Put that in here. Don't worry about anything else. That doesn't really matter. All I care about is the focal length. Then we can go to the camera icon, the next one down, and this is where you want to enter your sensor size. By default, this will be a full frame camera sensor, which is your Nikon D850 or your Canon EOS RA or 5D, whatever it is you have. For those shooting with a crop sensor camera, or maybe even something else, you'd want to make sure you update this with the correct information. If you have no idea what your camera sensor size is, not a big deal. If you go to digicamdb.com, digital camera database, you can just Google that, you'll find it. You can choose whatever camera you have. For example, maybe you have a Canon T7. T7i, we'll go with that. We'll hit go. And it's going to tell us right here what the sensor size is, 22.3 by 14.9 millimeters. Now that I know that number, I can go back to Telescopius, put in 22.3 by, I already forget, 14.9. And you probably weren't able to tell, but we've actually zoomed in a little bit because we have a smaller sensor. That's something we covered in the previous video where the smaller your sensor is, the more magnification you're going to get. And I think a better way to demonstrate this is let's start off with a 600 millimeter lens that's about as big as you can get with a crop sensor camera you actually don't even have enough room to get both the running man and orion i mean you're cutting it pretty close and you might decide maybe i have too much zoom in that case if you have a zoom lens you can just zoom out to 500 millimeters and there you go now you've got a nice shot of orion filling the frame 
If you have two camera bodies though, maybe you wanna put this on your full frame camera instead, which again should be 36 by 24 if I remember correctly. And now that gives us a wider field of view. I've got a full article that will explain this in more detail because it is kind of confusing for beginners. That'll be in the link below if you want to read through that. The general thing though is that you're going to use Telescopius, type in whatever object you want here, maybe Andromeda. Once you get your field of view here, then again put in whatever focal length you think you're going to use. This is the actual focal length. You don't want to apply any adjustments to it. So maybe you only have a 300 millimeter lens. And if you pair that with a full frame sensor, it's not really going to give you a a big view of Andromeda. You can either get more zoom or a smaller camera sensor, like a crop sensor camera, which again is like 22.3 by 14.9, roughly something like that. And now that 300 millimeter lens, same lens, but with the smaller camera sensor really helps to fill the frame. And this is how I'm able to get really amazing images with a small 250 millimeter telescope and a small dedicated astro camera sensor. Because the sensor is so small, I'm magnifying that 250 millimeters and I'm able to fill the frame when otherwise it would just not be enough zoom at 250 millimeters. Again, I'd recommend you read the article on my website for more information. And that's about all I've got for you today. We covered the basics of planning out your astrophotography photo shoot. Now you should have the information you need to effectively plan things out. All that's left is to learn how to set everything up, what camera settings you'll need after we've captured our images, then we'll head over to post-processing. So that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.